assumption. Okay, guys, um, we're going to be presenting um, chronic obstructive pulmonary hypertension. So our patient is Gary Hansen. He's 56. Um, he's been a um, couple day smoker. Um, since his 20s, and he's currently still smoking. He presented to the emergency room with severe dyspnea and excessive coughing and palm inflammation. He's complaining of tightness across his chest and severe discomfort. Um, and on examination, Gary is alert but talking in short sentences. His coffee drop phlegm is saying that he's very busy. So our concerns are his breath rate and oxygen saturation because they're high in oxygen as well. So what is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Well, it's an umbrella term. It's used to describe lung conditions that make it difficult these conditions are usually long-term and they're progressive, so they worsen over time. Um, the most common are emphysema, chronic um, bronchitis, and chronic asthma. So, as you can see over here, um, chronic asthma and chronic people, chronic bronchitis, will have a similar response to um, irritants. However, the difference is that they're caused by, they're treated by different things. So in response, as we can see, the um, bronchial walls will become inflamed, they'll thicken, and they'll narrow, and that will impair the airflow. As you can see here, it's open in a healthy bronchus, in an unhealthy one with um, bronchitis and asthma, they'll narrow and they'll um, produce and that's because the mucus secreting glands and goblet cells are increase in number and in activity. So this along with the decreased cilia ciliary function will cause um, the hypersecretion of mucus and it will make it difficult for the lungs to release all that excessive mucus. Um, this, is, this will explain why Gary is constantly coughing up phlegm trying to remove the um, mucus. Um, and also, when auscultating someone's lungs, someone who has COPD will often hear wheezing and cackles, and that's because of that liquid. And also, um, many people will complain of tightness across the chest and that's because um, muscles, um, of the muscles surrounding the bronchioles, they'll constrict and they will cause that um, tightness all the more difficult to treat. Um, and with emphysema, we will have um, the, infl the inflammatory response will um, cause neutrophils to release proteases, um, elastase to be exact, um, and that's an enzyme that will destroy the walls, as we see here. It will destroy the walls of the alveoli. Um, and the destruction of the alveoli um, will mean that the contact between the wall and the pulmonary capillaries will decrease. And what that means is that gas exchange will decrease and that can cause, um, that can impair oxygen diffusion or lead to hypoxemia and hypercapnia. So normally on inhalation, the elastic fibers um, will allow for the alveolus to expand. That's during inhalation. In exhalation, they will recoil. It's a really um, good system that we have in healthy um, alveoli. But with someone with emphysema, they will be able to inhale, but that will be with force. So as we see with Gary, he will find that um, it will take a lot of effort for him to breathe because he's actually doing it consciously. He's trying hard to breathe um, at these. And that's because the elastic fibers are destroyed by this enzyme. Um, um, and so in exhalation, um, you will find that it will be difficult for the elastic fibers to recoil. And what that will mean is um, that a lot of air will be trapped inside his lungs. Um, and it will make it really hard to breathe out. And you will um, hear a lot of people with COPD, they'll have complaint of shortness of breath because they're, um, they're always trying to you know, take all that extra.
texture here that's stopping the alveoli that. Safely prescribe, dispense, 
and administer uh, medication to make patients who are informed of the clinical consent. And from nursing management, um, we've done a combination of things around nursing management. So we're going to combine managing the symptoms, maximising their function and comfort, and education to enhance self-care, and importantly addressing the psychosocial issues that um, occur when it's with a doctor from UNC. So in regards to the medication, it's an important factor that nurses need to address and make sure that Gary's adhering to. This can be done using the five rights to medication for the right drug, dose, patient, uh, the time and the route. We also need to document it and have a solid reason as to why we're giving Gary these medications. We as nurses also need to educate him on these drugs and tell him why he's on them, what it's going to do, how he is to take it and when to take it. Um, also any complications such as side, side effects and any other indications of any other drugs. Um, the main reason that we do give the medication is to reduce symptoms and to reduce the frequency and severity of exacerbations with his COPD and to also improve Gary's overall health status and his exercise tolerance. We also want to uh, stop Gary's smoking. So smoking is an addiction because of the nicotine. Um, so as nurses, we need to keep in mind that there may be relapses. Ways that we can stop Gary smoking is using a quit line. Um, we can also counsel Gary throughout the process of the treatment and as described by the Global Initiative for the Chronic um, Obstructive Disease, we can use a five step strategy, asking, advising, assessing, assisting and arranging. Um, these can all be small steps for Gary to work his way through the smoking um, cessation and to aid him throughout the whole process of the COPD treatment. In terms of a rehab program for Gary, similar to uh, counselling and um, quit lines and stuff, a rehab program can be used to help treat non-pulmonary based problems such as uh, we've got a lack of exercise, social, isolate, social isolation, altered mood states, uh, in particular depression because that comes in turn with COPD and not being able to do your normal activities, uh, muscle, weight, muscle wasting and weight loss. Uh, so the main components of the programs can include uh, improving the quality of life for Gary using uh, components such as exercise, uh, exercise training, smoking sensation like I described before, nutrition counselling and education about the disease and what he can do himself and also his family too to help him throughout the treatment. A minimum of a six week program is ideal for the success and that will also include help from other physicians, dietitians, and the nurses, and of course his family. As Amelia said before, there's oxygen therapy, which will reduce his COPD. We want to have him on the oxygen therapy straight away, and it will be constant because he does find it hard to breathe. We aim to reach the oxygen saturation of 90% as a minimum with Gary, and nurses, we will be monitoring that throughout the whole time. Um, we need to keep this treatment constant and ongoing while he's in the hospital setting and while he's at home. And we also need to keep that airflow constant so he's not struggling to breathe. As a last um, minute, really, option, there are surgical procedures that you can have for COPD. These procedures are costly, they are invasive, and sometimes not available, especially with the lung transplants, because Sometimes and most often there are not enough organ donors to provide the actual lungs. Um, we are able to inform Gary of these procedures in terms of what they do, so the lung volume reduction surgery and the bolectomies and the lung transplants, like I said before. Um, however, it should be a last resort and only if Gary really, really needs it. In terms of maximising the function and comfort, we can use breathing techniques. These can be done all throughout the day and done by Gary when he feels he needs to. Two types of techniques are purse lift breathing and the diaphragmatic breathing as well. I'm just going to quickly do this, sorry. Um, what we can do with the breathing, um, I'm not sure if that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, what we can do with the breathing, you can slowly breathe in through your nose and exhale out through your mouth as if you're blowing a candle. And the diaphragmatic breathing encourages you to use your abdominal muscles to breathe um, instead of your chest muscles instead. 
composite tubing can also be used um, to help Gary breathe, which will allow him to open up his lungs. This can include uh, the tripod positioning, where he leans over using his arms or he can lean on a table. This opens up his chest and opens up his airways to enable more oxygen to come in. Um, we need to inform Gary that this doesn't reduce the mucus, so he'll need to cough more if he wants to get rid of that. It's just a way of letting in more air. For me, a last, lastly, I'd just like to talk about energy conservation techniques and identifying the best breathing times for Gary. Um, keeping an energy diary is really important to find out when he finds it easiest to breathe throughout the day and when he finds it harder. We can then, as nurses and his family, um, dictate tasks to those parts where he's finding it easiest to breathe and alternate between heavy and light tasks. Um, we can also organise his daily activities between heavy tasks and light tasks, so he's not using all of his energy at the same time and then having none for the rest of the day. Pacing himself, um, generally doing what he's able to do and encouraging him to feel confident with what he's doing and not to stress that if he can't do it, it's not an issue. And using assisting tools, so such as walking frames is a really big one that will help. Um, walking around can be quite exacerbating for them at the very start of COPD. So if he uses a walking frame or a walking stick, it will reduce the stress on the body to maintain those activities. Okay, um, another one for maximizing function and comfort is um, monitoring his diet. So as hopefully you would all know, good diet equals um, good nutrition and good health. So for uh, Gary in particular, he's eating lots of protein because protein creates antibodies in the body. His lungs, since they've got a lot of mucus and he can't excrete that properly, it's a breeding ground for infections. So protein would be good to create those antibodies to fight those things off. Uh, next would be a reduction in sodium, so that's salt in the diet. Salt can increase water retention, which therefore increases um, your blood pressure, which can make it harder for the lungs to breathe. And in Gary's case, we don't want any shortness of breath. Our regular fluids, the fluids in the body come in and the water helps thin that mucus, which would make it easier for him to cough up, which is good to get that all out. Um, so again, reducing his exposure to air pollution. So air pollutions are everywhere. It can be pollen from traffic, dust, or even secondhand smoke. So it's really important that Gary tries to um, limit the amount of air pollution that he's exposed to. So things could be like keeping his home um, well vacuumed, turning on the ventilators on full when he's cooking, um, keeping away from other smokers or asking them to stop smoking when he's around them. So it doesn't, just doesn't irritate his lungs. Um, next we've got his education about the disease. Now these are imperative um, for Gary because the more he understands about the disease and most importantly the consequences that relate from having chronic obstructive pulmonary, di pulmonary disease make him more likely to um, think of adhere, adhere to his medications and to seek care outside of the hospital environment and to continue his care independently. Um, the next is, for us as nurses, the appropriate referral to um, outpatient services. So this could be things like a home nurse and doctor service. So you've got regular healthcare in the home. Even though he might be managing his COPD, regular checkups from a nurse or a doctor can make sure that he's on track and that he's not deteriorating. Um, you can also do things like contact the Lung Foundation Australia. There's an online um, website and a direct hotline that he can use if he just even wants someone to talk to about it or if he's any, having any concerns or complaints. Um, next is an outpatient dietitian to create a diet plan for him if he's struggling to um, eat properly and COPD support group. So that way he can contact a lot of other people who have COPD and um, just get a lot of information and support from people who also have the disease. Lastly is oxygen education. Uh, this is really important because if, if, if he's got oxygen at home and he's using that in his house, it's important that he knows that it's a flammable um, gas. If he's letting that um, run free and then he goes up and lights a cigarette, he could essentially blow himself up, which is not <laughs> ideal. So he would need signs around his home for either the postman or the electrician to let them know that he's got um, oxygen in use and for him to keep all that clean. If he's using prongs or a Hudson mask, it's recommended to change those every two weeks to keep bacteria from getting into his lungs. And lastly, the inclusion of his family and friends. Um, inclusion of his family and friends can create a support network for him. It can encourage him to make um, positive and healthy decisions because he has those people around him that would want to see him get better. So having that network can
can make him feel more motivated and adhere to his medications and his treatment plan. And also educate the family. Educating his family and friends can make them aware of signs of deterioration. So if Gary is feeling um, sick, he might not be aware of it, but his family can say, oh, you know, you're not breathing very well today. We need to get you off to emergency to check that out, just to avoid potential crisis. And most importantly, um, addressing all the psychosocial issues with COPD. Uh, COPD is a debilitating disease, and with any debilitating, debilitating disease, it can seriously affect their lifestyle, which can affect um, their state of mind, because he won't be able to do a lot of things he normally um, would be able to do. He might not be able to go on family trips and things like that, because he's constantly feeling short of breath and fatigued. Um, so you've got to address the issue, encourage him to keep seeking treatment and to do the best he can, and just make sure that everyone around there is there for him. Lastly, we've got the standards. So standard one is um, governance for safety and quality in health service organisations. Uh, so this standard is relevant to Gary, so it means the whole healthcare team is divided, uh, is guided by evidence-based practice. That's the best practice available for him. So standard five is patient identification and procedure matching. So that's just matching the procedure with the patient, making sure you're not getting the wrong patient because it would be uh, detrimental to give a treatment to the wrong patient. And standard six is clinical handover. So um, this is a process of not only handing over information but handing over legal responsibility from one healthcare professional to the other. So anyone new that comes into the team will have to hand over that information. And the last standard is standard nine are recognising and responding to clinical deterioration. So if he's not doing too well, it's our job to um, address that deterioration before it turns into a crisis. And that's all. Fantastic. Thank you. I know. Okay, questions? All right. Regarding to consideration when administering oxygen, I heard you said that no more than two liters per minute. Do you know why? Can you administer oxygen um, to a COPD patient, same as the other patients C without? COPD patients, their, their body is so used to having more carbon dioxide in the blood than oxygen, as they can't get that oxygen in. So sometimes when you give too much oxygen into a COPD patient, they're um, body thinks they don't have to breathe anymore as they've got too much, as they've got lower COPD, so they may stop breathing. So it's always better to give only two litres and see how they go to first. It'll also vary between the treatment process for Gary um, with the oxygen therapy. Sometimes he may have more, sometimes he may have less. It'll depend on his um, observations that we take as nurses to see where he's at because it will vary and that'll vary for other, pe other people as well. If he continues smoking, <laughs> yeah. yes, 100%. If he continues smoking and his lungs just essentially stop working, they stop being able to transport that oxygen from his lung to his muscles, most importantly, his brain and his heart. Stop. <laughs> Don't need to be nervous. <laughs> <laughs>